Welcome to the worldwide teach-in on climate and justice. Bienvenue à la conférence mondiale éducative sur le climat et la justice. Bem-vindo ao encontro participativo global sobre clima e justiça. Today we are coming together globally to share our concern for the climate crisis, for climate justice, and to find solutions. We understand that carbon pollution is causing the planet to heat up. We see the fires and floods, the droughts and crop failures. This teaching will help us all move from despair about this to determination together to change the future. Why climate and justice? Global warming is profoundly unjust. People in low income communities are already suffering the most as the planet heats up. In the last year, tens of millions of people have been forced to leave their homes by climate change, more refugees than from conflict and violence combined. We can stop this. We can stabilize the climate and in doing so, create jobs and opportunities for all in a new green economy. What will it take? Our hard work and the courage to face it. It's not really that bad. Oh yeah, it is. Climate change, it's pretty close to home for South Carolina. From the, the UK's city of Charleston flooded on record to raging wildfires in California. These winds died down. This fire is unstoppable. Ferocious fires scorched terrain as Earth Water heats. shortage is forcing more than 13 million people to have to boil their water before they can use it. Marcus Moore. It can take air out of my little brother's lungs. What if it submerges my Bangladeshi land of love, magic, stories, and songs? I'm afraid my hands can do nothing to stop the downpour. I'm afraid it will leave us alone in a world of concrete and plastic. Groom Gaia into a vacant void. It, it will take, take the, the green and leave, leave us in, in the, the dark. dark. I'm afraid it will bring out the worst in people. Uprooting our families and communities. Leaving our children to an irreversible nightmare. Taking the beauty of each season from us. Causing untold suffering that could have been prevented. I am afraid. I'm 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 afraid. What are we being taught? What are they teaching us? Economics, literature, math, engineering, history, music. What meaning do they hold if our clients swallow this whole? I can be courageous. I can be courageous. I can be courageous. I can use my voice and passion. Keep fighting even on the days it feels hopeless. I can fight for my people. I can hold on to the beauty we still have. I can save our land against this man-made havoc. I can be a voice for the sky, the soil, and the sea. I can make a good future for our next generation. I can stand up, even when it feels easier to sit down. I can love my brothers and sisters and protect their lives, but we have to say mother, the great mother earth. I can be louder than polluters that try to silence life. I can do my part and lead others around me to do better. I can ask my teacher to make climate a class. I can ask my teacher to make climate a class. I can ask my teacher to make climate a class. Make climate a class. Make climate a class. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to UNE's One Night Teach-In for Climate and Justice. My name is Bethany Woodworth, and I'm professor in the School of Marine and Environmental Programs, and I'm also coordinator of UNE's interdisciplinary minor in climate change studies. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Wabanaki Nation, which includes the, the uh, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy people on whose ancient and sacred land we live, work, and play. As a community, we recognize the ever-present systemic inequalities and inequities that stem directly from past wrongdoing, and we commit ourselves to respecting and reconciling this long history of injustice. Solving the dual and intertwined challenges of climate and justice will require the expertise and ways of knowing of all of us. This is ethicists and economists, philosophers, psychologists, and scientists, 
artists and physicians, writers and business persons and sociologists. And so tonight we have brought together colleagues from 26 different disciplines across the University of New England community. We will begin the evening with a keynote address from the Reverend Lennox Yearwood. And following that, there will be two breakout sessions, one at 6 o'clock and one at 7 o'clock. Um, you will be able to select from between three and four different panels to attend during each of those breakout sessions. The highlight of the panels will be what we hope is an invigorating and robust discussion among all of the attendees about the issues raised during the uh, session. At this point, it is my pleasure to introduce the sixth president of the University of New England, Dr. James Herbert. Since assuming the UNE helm at 2000 in 2017, President Herbert has overseen the creation and implementation of UNE's current strategic plan, Our World, Our Future. And he has led the university in making a number of important investments in the programs and students. He has led the effort to decarbonize UNE's investment portfolio and has overseen our progress towards becoming carbon neutral by 2040. He has also ingrained his warm and engaging presence in the daily lives of our students and our faculty. Please join me in welcoming President Herbert. That's very kind, thank you. Put the microphone up here. So, hello everyone. It is nice to see such a great turnout for the, this evening. Um, I, I'm really glad to see you all and to see so many people um, where I can actually see you from the nose down as well. So it's nice that we're finally able to begin removing the masks. Um, I am so glad that UNE is able to participate in this global event, this uh, worldwide impactful event um, looking to create a healthier planet for all of us. And I'd like to begin my remarks by thanking Bethany uh, Woodward, Alethea Kariti, where's Alethea? I know she's here somewhere. Um, and uh, Colleen Bader for working tirelessly to plan this valuable evening with so many moving parts that they had to coordinate. So very grateful to you guys for your help. At the same time, I'd like to express my gratitude to two organizations that partnered with UNE to sponsor tonight. Um, and those are the Climate Initiative and the Kennebunkport Conservation Trust. So thank you to both organizations for co-partnering with us. And I'd also like to acknowledge the many members of our UNE faculty and professional staff that are participating tonight in these panel discussions. So thank you all. So I think more than any other event that I can remember during my tenure here at UNE so far, this event embodies our institution's tripartite commitments to diversity, equity, and inclusion, to robust discourse, and to the health of our planet. As you'll see, the complexities of these interwoven issues cut across disciplinary silos. Every field that we study here at UNE is somehow touched by and or contributes to addressing climate change as well as social inequality and injustice. We will address these challenges using evidence and reason sharpened through the process of robust discourse. The format of tonight's event, short panel presentations followed by ample discussion time, emphasizes the interdisciplinary and interpersonal approaches that we so value here at UNE. Tonight's program focuses our attention on two of the greatest challenges of our time. But knowing that UNE will bring the full measure of our expertise and talent to meet them gives me some degree of hope. Thank you to all the members of our community who are committed to this work, but most of all to our students, many of whom are with us here tonight. Students, I've seen how passionate and driven you are when it comes to fighting for the health of our planet and combating injustice. And I know you will carry on the work long after your professors have seeded the leadership roles that they now hold in your fields. I know you will use the spirit of innovation, the critical thinking, problem solving, and communication skills, and the dogged perseverance you've nurtured during your time here at UNE to shape our world into a better one. Hopefully tonight's activities will help you clarify the roles that you can play in your fields to create the future that we all imagine. 
And I'm sure tonight's speaker will bring greater clarity to our mission as well. And at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce him. Reverend, Reverend Leonard uh, Lennox Yearwood, I apologize, Lennox Yearwood Jr. So Reverend Lennox Yearwood Jr. is the president and founder of the Hip Hop Caucus, making him one of the most influential people in hip hop political life today. This nonprofit, nonpartisan, multi-issue organization is dedicated to addressing core challenges facing underserved and vulnerable communities with programs and campaigns that support solution-driven community organization led by today's young people. As a national leader within the Green Movement, the Reverend Yearwood has been working to bridge the gap between communities of color and environmental advocacy. With the diverse set of celebrity allies, he has raised awareness and action in communities that are often overlooked by traditional environmental campaigns and elected officials. His innovative stance has garnered the Hip Hop Caucus support from several environmental leaders, including the Sunrise Movement, the League of Conservation Voters, Earth Justice, and Zero Hour. The Reverend Yearwood is a leading voice in calling for divestment from fossil fuels, as well as in efforts to increase diversity in the climate movement and to ensure that everyone has clean air and water. He has fought on the front lines for vulnerable communities, including at the international climate negotiations in Paris and in efforts to fight a new oil pipeline developments in Maryland and Standing Rock. He's been dubbed a, a new green hero by Rolling Stone magazine and recognized by the Obama White House as a champion of change. So please join me in giving a big Nor'easter welcome to the Reverend Yearwood. Really honored to, to be here um, at the University of New England. Um, Want to make sure? Do you say UNE or you just is any other? That's how you say no, no, no. In DC, they have all kind of acronyms, so maybe you know <laughs> everything. They kind of just blend together. Um, but really, an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I actually know your school because um, both my sons now go to school in Maine. Um, and so one of my sons, are there any hockey players here? No, no, no hockey players. Okay, well, got to get them here for the climate stuff now. That's some, <laughs> you know, they should be here front row. The ice is kind of important, you know what I mean? <laughs> it gets, gets too hot. They go on and well, nothing to do. They have to get their rollerblades out. So, <laughs> so they're going to need to figure that one out. So you got to tell them that. Tell them you all missed your moment. You had one moment here at the UNA and you missed it. Rev shouted you out and you weren't even there to get it. So my son plays hockey. He actually goes to Central Maine Community College. And so he actually is there and he plays college. And so first time I ever saw a UNE uniform was when he was playing them, actually. So was there and that was my first time. And then I actually met you, a lot of your amazing students at Kobe College. I know some of you, I actually had the opportunity to speak there. And then you guys came up and it was just great to meet you. And then I immediately recognized that you had a a wonderful, I can just tell then that you had a wonderful um, environment and you should be excited about that. Nothing else that I would meet your, your staff um, and folks who welcomed me very much so, um, which was just a very lovely welcome. Your president, very lovely president. Uh, actually, he's from my neck of the woods originally, um, from where he was from. I'm originally from Louisiana. He's really from Texas. so. You know, we, we both really don't do well in snow, I guess. That's probably how that, that goes. So it's really an honor to be here and to have this conversation with you. Um, I wanted to start off with something very special, actually, just for you. I've never done this before. Um, and so, and we're here, so why not? You, you'll get something very special. Um, did anybody here see the movie Don't Look Up? Let me see. Okay, well, 90% of you. So I don't want to give, uh, for, for those who didn't see it, it came out like in December, so you should have saw it then. <laughs> so unfortunately, you know, I'm going to start, but Netflix asked me and several other uh, climate um, advocates 
to present a different ending to that. And so I actually want to read to you my ending for Netflix. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, well, here you go. So you can go to Netflix, and you can see everybody else. I don't know if they're going to read it to you. Like, I'm about to read it to you right now, though. So you want to get an extra treat in that aspect. But so this is, this is, my, end, this is my ending for the movie. Um, this thing kicked us off into our conversation. So they literally asked a question at Netflix. They said, could Don't Look Up have ended differently? And so they went further to ask um, 14 climate experts about their position on that. So that you, you can read it. You can actually, it, just, it just came out. But this is, this is mine. So this is my... And I can actually say that they put mine right up top there. So I guess they, I'm not sure if they liked it or not. They just put it there. But so this is how it goes. So this is how I thought it should have ended. Now, I will tell you this. Netflix gave me a, some parameters, though. They said that I can't have the world destroyed in our version. And I was like, well, that's kind of a bummer. I mean, you know. <laughs> I mean, we <laughs> Take away, I got to save the place then. That's kind of, a, that's kind of a, a challenge. So that was what they, that was everyone who had to do this, had to do this. So anyways, my title, that interview with a new title, was called Look to Flint. And so after Kate DiBiaschi, who was Jennifer Lawrence, tells people at Bojo Mambo's why the Comet Diversion Mission was turned around. A special news report featuring morning talk show hosts Jack Bremer and Bree Evanfee, which was Tyler Perry and Kate Blanchett, takes over TVs everywhere. The hosts admit that they were wrong and urge people to look up. Media across the globe from Washington, D.C. to Rio begin to broadcast the truth and global mobilization ensures. In Michigan, a group of audio engineering students at Flint Central High School get in contact with Kate and Randall, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, to share a unique solution the students develop technology that allows them to move large objects via sound waves. They have been pranking people in their neighborhoods by moving parked cars from one side of the street <laughs> to the other. So collectively, they present their solution to President Orlean, but she and an elite group of billionaires have already undergone the freezing method and have launched into space. Scientists at NASA figure this out and amplify the student's technology, making it strong enough to divert the comet in time to save humanity. A new collective future is ushered in on Earth with President Orlean and the billionaires meeting their fate on another planet 22,000 years later. Look to Flint. So that was, and there were some amazing other other things that were that were there. So I lead with that, um, with the power of storytelling and narrative organizing. Um, the one thing about this crisis that we're in is that it's a real crisis that we're in, and that we as humanity have to solve. It is not a black crisis or a white crisis or a brown crisis or a red crisis or a male crisis or a female crisis or a straight crisis or a gay crisis or a theist crisis or atheist crisis. It is a human crisis that we are living in right now. It's a real crisis. That's the thing that I have to tell you. Leave nothing else. Know that we are in a real crisis. We're in a crisis in which literally our planet, our home, is in a place where it would not be livable for us. 
in certain ways. Or it becomes so disastrous, so uncontrollable in regards to our weather patterns by having droughts and wildfires and you name it, hurricanes and tornadoes and wars, that it would become a place that would be not only hostile, it would become a place that would be literally a place that would be unlivable for humanity. So it is something that doesn't matter if your political background or your geographic background, if you're a Republican or a Democrat, if you're from America or some other place on this amazing planet. It is a crisis that we have to solve. If we don't solve it, President, then one of the things here that we will find out quickly is that it will solve itself. Hence my hat. I wear a lot of hats. And my hat that I'm wearing now is one that is really in regards to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is put forth by the UN. And they had put out a report that said we had 12 years um, to make things happen. Literally, that we've already gone too far in many cases. So to some aspects, the die is cast. But they had put forth by numerous scientists saying that we still have these 12 years to literally make some things happen. If we come together, get wise up, we can begin to push things forward. And so every single year since that report came out, I've been just getting a new hat. And so I had 12 years, and now I had 11. And so and I was 10, and I was 9, and it's 8. So it's actually quite a depressing hat, to be honest. But um, it's, it gets the point across in some aspects that this is where we are. So we're in a moment where we have eight years to really make the changes, which is one, daunting, but also, on the other hand, incredibly inspiring for you and for your colleagues to say that we as humans can come together and make a change. So with that, my job is to do exactly what the movie Don't Look Up was trying to do, which is try to convey through narrative organizing and storytelling the best way to broaden and grow this movement. Because the problem is that there are many people who actually don't even know that we're in a crisis. Imagine now if, God forbid, that this building was on fire and the alarms were not working in this room. Everybody else heard the alarms and they've all streamed out. They don't even know we're in here. And while we're in here, the building is on fire being consumed. And we literally, to the point, to the last minute, looked over and saw, oh, wow, um, President, I don't think you got a barbecue in the hallway, do you? <laughs> and like, no, I don't think we do. And so in that aspect, it would be too late for us. That's where we are in this crisis. That's my job. I want us to get outside of the building because the building, in the words of Greta Thunberg, is on fire. And so I want us to get out of the building in a way that we can escape the catastrophe that we're in. So with me, my job at Hip Hop Caucus and the many amazing folks there has been to use storytelling and narrative organizing to do that. And we've been doing that for the past now 15, 16 years, just without vote. Now, that comes with a cost. I must tell you how that story starts. As I mentioned I'm originally from Louisiana. So back in 2005, Many of you who were just young lads, or even not even born, I'm not even sure you were, I'm not sure how you old you were. Since my kid goes to school alongside you, I can tell you how he was five and four, or three or two, wherever he was. He was a baby, so he really pay, wasn't paying too much mind. But most of you have seen things and visuals of Hurricane Katrina. And in that aspect, with that storm, that shaped me. Because I, being from Louisiana, I having family in New Orleans, literally saw my family and friends drowning before my eyes. I was in Washington, D.C. at the time. And there's nothing worse than to turn on CNN and you recognize people. That's really a bad thing. I don't hope that, you hope you never had that experience. But if you turn on your TV and you recognize, oh, that's my market. And that's the street where Mama D lives and that's where Sess is around the corner from there where his record store is. And you begin to recognize that, hold on, that's the top of where his record store would be. But the rest of it is underwater. And you begin to realize that this is a disaster. And so in that aspect with Hurricane Katrina, I watched particularly my community, 
particularly poor people and black people, literally drowning in the richest country in the world. And being president of the Hill Caucus, I began to say we have to do something to move to action. Now, uh, that story gets even deeper because there were people who were in that process who literally, folks like Mama D, who lived on Dershawan Street in the Seventh Ward, who literally was, when the waters came, she stayed behind. And Mama D was around 60 at the time. Beautiful, beautiful black woman with amazing gray dreadlocks, just all the way down the back um, to the, the crest of her back. And Mama D and her son literally stayed in their home, but as the senior citizens in her neighborhood began to float down the street, like coming down the steps here. She would see them as they were floating down the street, catch them and tie them to the tree because she didn't want them to be eaten by alligators or literally just be lost. That is what this can do. I need that you need to get that visual. This is something that is horrific. That when we and our planet begins to go against us, it is horrific the consequences of the climate crisis. It is not a nice thing. It is a very ugly thing that begins to transpire in these communities. So Mama D would tie them to the tree and most of you who were too young, some of you who are a little older saw what happened and people were left behind and people were then put on buses and people were sent away in that aspect. But we didn't learn then. That was the first thing. We didn't learn then back in 2005 um, at that moment to make changes. As a matter of fact, this is where the other, to be honest, the villain comes into the story. There's a fossil fuel industry that makes quite a lot of money. It's unfortunate because we did use a lot of that to make our world better at one time. We had an industrial age and it was a time where we used fossil fuels. But now we have, we realize, as my hat and other things says, we cannot continue to do and live like that. We cannot continue to burn coal and use gas and use oil. It's just that we have to transition from fossil fuels to clean energy. It's just the way it is. If we continue to use it, then we are going to continue to have horrific consequences. Unfortunately, there's something called greed and money. And there are those who don't want to transition. Oh, don't want to transition fast enough. And so when Hurricane Katrina was brought into the scene, it was a situation in that aspect that they then literally began to create climate denial. That was the time when they said, well, People are going to be heartfelt by these terrific things that they're seeing. So we're going to just deny this happening at all. We're just going to just say it's, there is no such thing as climate crisis. We're just going to say it's, it's not happening. What you see is not the fire in the hallway. You're not, you're not seeing that. What you're really seeing is just nothing. It's made up. They're just doing it. It's a left-wing propaganda. It's a joke. Forget that. And so, unfortunately, that began to divide our country. We're not in a bad situation. People have taken sides. And you move forward, though, that really doesn't work because now more and more people are realizing, oh, hold on. We're getting more and more hurricanes. We're not going through the Greek alphabet in hurricanes. We now have wildfires. We now have droughts. We now have just some consequences that are terrible. There's bleaching going on. Literally this week or last week, part of the Arctic fell off the size of New York. We're in a really rough situation. So now climate denial doesn't work as a strategy anymore. So they move from climate denial to climate delay. Well, we're just going to just delay the policies to, to, to help this process. We're going to do all we can. And then from there, the climate dilute. If you do get policies, then we're going to make them so watered down, we can't do anything. So that's where we are. We're in a situation now in which we are literally in a crisis but we have those who do not want to transition. So what do we do about it? How do we get there? And that's what our conversation is. Now, one of the things about this conversation about environmental justice and climate justice is that it also links into other things that are going on at the same time. So one of the things that I will say is that climate justice is also racial justice, and racial justice is climate justice. Now, some of you might say, well, how does that work, Rev? How does climate justice and racial justice, is, is the air racist, is the water racist? No, no, not at all. Thank goodness for that. No, that's that day. <laughs> My goodness, I, I was like, take it, that was the case. 
You know what I'm saying? I wear my pipe in the morning and turn on and like water don't come out and say, hey, I ain't going to no black homes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's ridiculous. The water races. Oh no. But what is racist is the process of the planning and the programming that goes alongside that. So what happens there is that people then look at communities and they say that that community is either a community that will not fight or becomes a sacrifice zone. That community is a path of least resistance. And because of, unfortunately, it might be, and sometimes not just, not just racist, but just also economics play, poor white people play this. Well, they, that community is a community that we can just build a pipeline through or put our plant next to or put our pollution next to or put our landfill next to, or put our chemical industries next to, because their lives are not worth, or maybe their lives are not worth, or pretty much they don't have the capacity to fight. They don't have good lawyers and good, and good policy. They can't just call up who they need to call up to make change. So because of that, we can put our stuff there, we can do it, we can make it cheap, make it happen. And that's how it becomes environmental injustice. And that's how race and poverty begin to play with our climate. Because then they put these things in those communities. As a matter of fact, did you know that 68% of people of color live within 30 miles of a coal-fired power plant? Like literally, that's where they're, there's so many places. Like, and it begins to connect. Like they're literally living next to these facilities. In these many cases, and so that's that's the thing. But those same facilities don't stop there, and that actually begins that the crisis. Now, this is where we come in at with our movement. The thing here with our movement is that well, how do we get a movement that looks like a predominantly white movement that's harming? people of color. Why isn't that movement balanced? And so to some degree, this is where the climate movement must take responsibility for a lot of the actions that they are in this position. So one of the things there that I just want to give a little bit of history in this is that we're having a teaching today, and I love that. That's such a a wonderful thing. There's history behind the teaching. This is really for those who are really, really good. This is for the old school, old school folks right there. Back in the day when the first Earth Day was created, um, the first Earth Day was actually considered and called supposed to be a teaching for the planet. That was the, that was the uh, uh, Senator Nelson from, from Wisconsin and many others who had came together and said, we're going to do this teaching for America. And then that was the, and back in before 1970, right around 1969, and that was really the birth of the, the environmental movement. And at that point in time, they were planning on the first Earth Day, which would take place on April 22nd, 1970. And in that aspect, when they were planning this first Earth Day, they're doing this teaching, and in this teaching, they begin to, at that time, really actually want to pull everybody together. A lot of things are happening in the world. Obviously, Dr. King had just been assassinated in 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. Ironically, fighting for sanitation workers, one of the first environmental justice actually movements being born with the I am a man process in Memphis, Tennessee. And then you go further, there's a, a burgeoning gay and uh, gay rights and trans rights movement that's coming out of New York City. And that process, there's a powerful women's movement that is coming across this country. There's a powerful indigenous movement that's actually taking over Alcatraz. And this, all this a great, there's a Vietnam movement. People are burning their draft cards. And there's this young people who are rising up and challenging. This is a great time. And so on, in that movement, the climate movement is born. And so they begin to create, and they say that the teaching thing actually doesn't work. That name doesn't really fly too well. So they go, Earth Day, and Earth Day is created in 1970, and at the time, President Nixon, he wasn't the green president, y'all, he was the president of the country at the time, but he creates the first EPA. Why do I say that? Because there's so much going on that's intersectional at that time that it creates energy, that creates change. The environmental movement, though, somehow begins in the 70s and 80s, begins to go into its silos. That's a whole other conversation. I hope in our breakout session we'll talk about that. But it does begin to become a siloed 
progressive movement, literally then blocking out other entities. And it becomes an East Coast and a West Coast movement even then. So even folks who are even quite white people who are like from Texas and Indiana, like, well, I don't even fit in this movement either. It's not, this ain't my movement. I don't fit here. And that's what begins to carry on. I make a joke sometimes, I, and I, I say this a lot. I say it becomes like a Birkenstock movement. But I say that, and now I'm like, you know, I don't want any Chris Rock moments, so I just, I don't want any, <laughs> You know what I mean? So, you know, when anybody be like, I might, oh, Ram starts walking down the aisle here. <laughs> I just got smacked by my We're breaking the stocks. You know, I don't, I don't want that. That's a joke if you start asking. That's a little, yeah, some of y'all might, some of y'all got to catch up to that one. I'm like, I'm going to come there. But the whole point here is that that's where we are. And so the job here then is that even when the environmental justice movement creates itself in Warren County, North Carolina in the 80s, in that aspect, still doesn't come together. So Rev, why are you saying all this to prepare us for our teaching? Why is this important for us? Because I start, I'm going to say with you how I started. We're in a crisis. And we now have to break the silos to be successful. The science is clear. We can go through that conversation. We can talk about the transition we need to make. We can go through that conversation. But the key thing here in this conversation in regards to climate justice and environmental justice is that we will not be successful if we as humans do not come together. That means that we are on a pathway for destruction if we do not break down the silos that impact other communities. It kind of angst because I feel like a person who pays for a kid who goes to school in Maine. So I know what it means for you to be sitting there. I know what it means to then be in this, and sometimes in this environment. My kid is in this environment, and I know how he does and what he does, and I have different kids. One plays hockey. As I'm pointing about hockey, he probably wouldn't be here either. But, you know, you know, he's not here. I'm here. He's not, he's not here. He's, he's up in Auburn. And so the key thing there is that we must first break down the silos in the climate movement to be successful. We must have a conversation that understands and connects the dots so that when George Floyd or Eric Garner and they're saying, I can't breathe, we must understand that, yes, they can't breathe because of police brutality, but in reality, they can't also be because of pollution in their communities. We must connect the dots. We must connect the dots that when young people are saying that they are afraid, literally young people are saying, I don't want to have children, or I don't want to live, or I don't want to do certain things in our community, we must listen to young people. They must be leading in this conversation. They must be the ones who must bring the energy because they're the ones who are literally saying that if it's bad right now in 2022, then 50 years from now, in 2072, when I'm just, my God, in my 70s, what does this look like? At that time, that's why I'm anxious. That's why I need you to, that's why I need, you and need to create curriculum and put programs together and have more teachings because this will be, I will be dealing with this. Not just making money or going off to have a home or a house or whatever. That's good. But if I, if my home has been washed away in the soccer somewhere, then I need to figure this thing out. The second thing, we need to change even how our movement is established. There's a crisis, so if people of color, if black and brown and, and, and indigenous people are not leading this movement, or even don't have a seat at the table, that can't be the movement that's going to bring us success. And then we must have a movement, because for so long, and this is just me, I hate, and no, please, this, I don't want any, you know, want any moments here, you know, <laughs> we must have a movement that is led by women. No offense to men, but it's because of a lot of men is why we're in the position we're in right now. And so we need a we need a we need a woman leaderful movement that encourages that and breaks apart from patriarchy and breaks apart from this having this 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 being this this patronizing that aspect. That's what we need to succeed. That's the movement we need. 
So also let me give you a few things as we move forward in this process. Because at the Hip Hop Caucus and what we've been doing has we've been trying to figure out what can also be successful. Because we don't need any more games in this process too. So one of the things that we've been speaking out, myself and Bill McKibben wrote an article about, it was, an, it, it was right before the pandemic in 2020, asking about what we could do regarding climate finance. I'm a big climate finance person, if you know my background. I'm really big into how we can utilize and transition structures. And I'm not anti, we be very clear. I'm not going, I'm not somebody, I will go out and, and get, throw down out front of the building, but I'll go inside too, because I'm a solutionary. I, don't, I, I, think we, I think that for my parents, they were revolutionary. And thank God for them at the lunch counter. And we still have lunch counter moments for our generation, but my generation, your generation, you, we have to be solutionary. Which means being solutionary means that we now have to figure out how to work with our enemies and work with those because we're all in this together. That's crit and, and that's different. So when my mom could just go to the lunch counter and not be served and protest and then get milk poured on them and, and have those black and white pictures, our generation, we can't just do that. Because even though that happens, we're still in this together. So one of the key things there is with climate finance. So I just want to just leave you with that as we begin to go to our other teachings. That's because it's a big deal for me. So climate finance for me has been something that how do we transition the financial structure? So we created something called Stop the Money Pipeline. And you can go to stopthemoneypipeline.com. That's your one homework. That's my one. I, listen, I hope I, I read to you. I read, my, I, read, I read my Netflix thing. I done got excited for you. Listen, you just got one homework assignment today. That's it. You can take that one. But you go to stopthemoneypipeline.com. And it's going to list out list of different things that you can do here as a, as a school, as a student, as faculty, as whatever. And one of the things there that we really have to transition our money and our to funding the fossil fuel industry. One of the things that we realized when we were in Standing Rock, um, which was one of the largest indigenous protesters in the world a few years ago, is that the money that was still back in these industries just couldn't stop that. So we created the money pipeline and we realized that we would be much more sophisticated in that process is then go to become shareholders in this aspect and, and go there. And in that aspect, go to these different facilities and these companies so they can begin to transition their money. You've heard about the divestment campaign. We've been very successful in divestment and investment. That's very important. And getting folks to divest from fossil fuels and invest in clean energy. But now we need for the banks and the insurance and the pension funds to do the same. Because if they keep propping up the fossil fuel industry, they will keep doing what they're doing. And so at SouthernMoneyPipeline.com, we're really working on that for them to do that. April and May is very important because that is when shareholders meetings take place. And so we need for, we have a lot of, I'm so proud of those, I'm actually very proud of those activist shareholders who, have, who are on some of these fossil fuel boards and they've been going in there and protesting. I mean, you know, that's, that takes guts in many cases. I'm proud of a lot of those who made their money from fossil fuel, like the Rockefeller family, who's now speaking out against it, and many others who are transitioning. I'm very happy about that. I'm happy for folks, you know, from, you know, who are former billionaires, from Tom Steyer to Mike Bloomberg, who are literally trying to figure out ways to use their resources to transition. It ain't all perfect, it ain't all nice, everybody ain't right, you know, we can all read that, that, I get all that. But I'm saying, well, we gotta work together. And so that's one of the most important things we can do. So I'll leave you with this. And this is probably the thing I want you to catch. So one thing I've told you about what a movement needs to do to change, I've told you the history of this movement, I told you who I think needs to be in charge of this movement, from people of color to women, and that would bring a success. I told you how we need to break down the silos in our movement to be successful. And we, I told you how we need to connect the dots between racial justice and climate justice and other movements. This is the last thing, though. I want you to feel this. And this is the piece here. I say a lot. A hundred years from now, this is really for the young people too, but everybody can get it. A hundred years from now will be 21 
22. And more than likely, none of us in this room will be here. That will be a position in this process where most of you are young, it's hard to imagine that when you're 20 or 19 or 21. It's hard to imagine that. But more than likely, you won't live to be 120, 130 years old. Unless you found some really good drugs <laughs> by that time. But more than likely, maybe, maybe not. But what will be behind will be your vigor and your energy and your passion to solve this climate crisis. I don't mean to be heavy on you as we try to our teachings, but I want to be real with you. I have done everything I can to work with folks like Beyonce, to create climate songs, to Common, to Neo. I've gone on tour with Amanda Seals and Kevin Sampson from Insecure. I've, I've, I've done a, we help create a comedy climate special with comedians on comedy called Ancient Mama's Heat Wave. <laughs> I'm right now in the midst of creating other documentaries with Dream Hampton who did Surviving R. Kelly and Wanda Sykes and Regina Hall and many, many others. I'm going to do everything I can because I need for that next generation to know if they have clean air and if they have clean water that we fought. But obviously I can't do it alone, and neither can you. But this is your moment. Today is your day. Today's a day, if you haven't been as vigorous, this is your moment to do it. So I just want to thank you for already putting everything you have. I want to thank you for having the awkward conversations you may be having with your family and friends. I want to thank you for being a better student and being more disciplined, and it's even what you have to do, because we need you to be at the brightest and the best of your ability. We really do. This is your moment. If you were having a rough time this semester, use this as a wake-up call. Say, man, Rev came by, and I'm ready to get it. I'm ready to get it, get it. Use this moment. Use this day for that, because if we fail, that means humanity fails. And we don't want that. We don't need no more wars for oil. Or wars, my goodness, because we can't put pipelines through a country. So we literally obliterate the country. That is outrageous. We need this moment. So 2022, y'all, let's get it. Let's make it happen. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for coming today, but um, environmental justice and environmental protection seems like an issue heavily weighed on by young people uh, to kind of solve the problem. So um, do you think there are any effective ways to bridge the gap between generations in order to develop an effective solution for the future? Yeah, I think it goes back to my part was saying with in regards to one, the history of the climate movement is the reason for that, um, that bridge you're talking about right now. And there's also that bridge within what I mentioned earlier about not understanding and connecting the dots to communities that are most impacted by environmental justice. Um, I think that young people are, because they are coming at this from an intersectional environmental um, perspective, get it. And so it's not, I don't think that other older folks, so to speak, <laughs> I like this, old folks, but they, they, that they don't get it. Um, some don't get it actually, but some, but, but, but they all don't get it is because I think that because of how they view this issue. Now, because I'm in a lot of these meetings with older and I'm on a numerous amount of boards from 
from the board of the League of Conservation Voters to the board of Methane Action to the board of Green 2.0. I mean, there's a whole bunch of these green org boards that I'm on. A lot of times, there are a lot of people who've been in these things for quite some time, and they are mostly, I mean, what I'm saying here, maybe I'm not saying from my lens, is that they're mostly predominantly white and men. And so their lens is that they actually have a good heart to want to change, but they actually don't understand what it means to then connect the dots. So to your point, I do think that young people can have understand the connection of dots, but I also think young people, this is kind of a little bit of a lens for you to look at it. I also don't think that they have seen um, the, the true history of environmental justice. I didn't mention in my little spiel here about Justice 40, which is very important, which is what President Biden is utilizing as a part of his environmental justice wide framework for his administration, which is I think is outstanding. And just as 40 means that at least 40% of the efforts that are used to go into fixing that crisis or problem go back to that community. So there's some great things that are happening there policy-wise, but to the point you're making, I just don't think it's just their framework. Now, I, it doesn't mean that they don't want it, I don't think they see it as a winning framework. And the environmental justice movements have been moved to what I call a kitty table approach. And what that happens is that a lot of times you have large environmental organizations that have really focused on um, conservation and have focused on wildlife, which is critical to this process, but have forgot the human part about this as a way of doing it. And so that connects you to happen. Young people get it because they're also young people, I'm sure all of you who are young people in here, are being pushed for issues from black lives to trans lives to women's rights to immigration. You're being pushed, and so your lens is different. But your lens is the right, correct lens. That's why I'm saying your lens is breaking down the silos. But just know that it's taken 50 years of creating those silos. And that's the problem why you're seeing that disconnect. I do think that what I'm hopeful for is that more investment from philanthropy um, is put into that. I am working with many different funders myself. I am senior advising for the Bloomberg Foundation. I'm senior advising, I'm working with, um, you know, in connection with from um, JPB or MacArthur or whoever. I'm hopeful that, and I'm what I'm pushing on the inside is that they are, they are holding those who are doing this work accountable to see that environmental justice is critical. And what I said before, and they're also funding young people and young people organizations to do this work. So they're funding Zero Hour, they're funding Generation Green, they're funding Sunrise Movement, they're creating new organizations. So that lens is very important. That's kind of what I was referencing to about needing young people, needing more people of color, needing women, to lead this, but also not just to lead it, but to fund them um, so they can do this work correctly. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you especially, Reverend Lennox Yearwood and James. Um, I, at this point, we are moving into the part of the evening where you can go and choose your own adventure, sort of. If you are looking forward to um, the Taking Action panel, that will take place in five minutes in this room. On the first floor in room 113, if you're looking at our changing world, one, room 113, protecting public health, will be in room 106, which is directly below us. And the climate and justice panel will be in room 304, directly above us. Thank you and see you soon.